all stand together this morning. All right, here we go. Sing together. It's coming on the clouds.
this morning we sing of our greatness, of our God, the greatness of our God and how he has provided a way for us to worship him. And Lord, what a great, true statement we have. And Lord, this morning as we gather for worship, Lord, as we gather to sing, but Lord, not just that, but we gather to give honor to whom honor is due. And Lord, that is to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Lord, that is who we give praise to this morning. We bless the Lord. Our souls gather and we say, you're worthy. So this morning, we just lift up this time together and say, God, please speak to our hearts. Lord, give us clarity through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everyone have a seat this morning. Real quick, while you're sitting next to the person next to you, while you're, while you're figuring that out, I want you to say, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, my name is so-and-so, and it's good to see you this morning. So do that real quick. So, so, so how well did you follow directions? Did you say, because the directions were, now I told you to say, my name is so-and-so. I didn't say fill your name in. So, so we will see. So, so what's funny is this, this morning, so by the way, I'm, I'm Aaron. I'm not normally the person that stands up here, but um, Josh is on vacation. So you guys get to hear from me for a rare occasion from up here. But I'm going to ask everybody, if you got your Bibles, turn to Genesis, Exodus. Um, we've been walking through the book of Exodus um, this year. Um, but here's my question here. How many people believe that God's word is true? Raise your hand. So we believe God's word is true. So we believe that the word of God is foundational for our walk with the Lord. But can we all agree that sometimes we don't always follow it the way that we should? Anybody here guilty of not following the Bible the way we should? All right, everybody, all hands go up. That includes me. All right, so I'm going to give you another test. So who here likes tests? No one does. All right, here's my challenge for you. I'll give you a minute. If you have a piece of paper, you can try and write them down. Can you name the Ten Commandments in order? In order. Can you do it? All right, just real quick, if you want to write it down, see if you can do it. You know, it, uh, I, always, I always think it's funny to give people quizzes. I, I thought about having everyone write it down on a piece of paper, say, pass it to the person on your right, <laughs> let them grade it after we're all said and done. Do you guys remember doing that in school? I hated that. Um, I like grading my own paper because then I could cheat. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't say that. No, no, don't cheat. Um, but if you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, we've been the people of God have been brought out of Egypt, and we have this picture of um, God's grace in bringing them forward in all of this. And the interesting thing I want us to really draw from this morning is I think it's really easy sometimes to get lost in the minutia. We're, we are going to read this passage, and all of us know these things. So, so real quick, we're going to read Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read all of the Ten Commandments. Uh, so here's what the Word of God has to say. I'm reading from the New American Standard, but... Um, read wherever you like, but here's what the Word of God says. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself idols of any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth, beneath or in the water or in the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Chapter, verse 7, you shall not take the, Lord's, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do not work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In, in it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters, your male or your female servants, your cattle, your sojourners who stay with you, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the, and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Verse 12, honor your father and mother, that your day may be prolonged in the land, which the Lord has given to you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, his male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain shaking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. All right, so how, how many of you got all 10 in order? 
and thinking through it. All of us can probably come up with 10 if we really think real hard about it, but doing them in order. So who here could say that you have lived up to the law your entire life? Nobody. All right, so here's what I do want you to talk to your neighbor about. Real quick, I want you to turn to your neighbor. What is the purpose of the law? I mean, think our Union Township police officers are right here. What is the purpose of the law? And I want you to, real quick, turn to your neighbor, and I want you to kind of flesh it out. If you don't have a neighbor, find a neighbor real quick um, and share with that person. So real quick, talk to the people around you. What do you think the purpose of the law is? So go. You don't have to whisper. You can talk to each other. It's okay. <laughs> so, so let's 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 hear from you guys. What is what would you say? What is the purpose of the law? Let's. This is your chance to speak back. What do you think? Guidance, protection, protection. Management. management. Okay. What's that? Well, I heard. To show we couldn't live up to, show us we're sinners. Um, you guys are pretty good. I, I give you I give you high marks for for your work. Um, the interesting thing is is that whenever we look at the law, um, the truth is is that I think sometimes we we as human beings view justice as being the law, and the truth is that's not what the law was created for. The law was created for three reasons. So if you're one of those note takers, there are three reasons of the law why we have the law, and it's to show man how sinful and distance they are from a holy God, to show how separate from God we are. Um, that was the purpose of the law. The next one is to show man needs a mediator to get to God. And the last one is, is to show, show us how to live um, to the full by showing the perfect nature of God. So let's, let's start with that first one. If we're going to talk about the Word of God and the fact that we believe that the Ten Commandments are something of value, and, and has anybody seen the news lately about the Ten Commandments? There was a, there was a monument that a guy ran over um, kind of, like, there's a, there's a war going on over the law, but the truth is, is that there is always a war on the law, right? And that's in our hearts, not somewhere else. The law is, the law is something that is ingrained in us, and God gave it to us to prove to us that we can't live up to it, which sounds really mean, doesn't it? Um, but here's, here's the thing I want to I draw out for us. If we read the first couple of the Ten Commandments, the thing is God divides it into three sections. These commandments begin, the first section of the Ten Commandments begins with this idea that God is separate than we are. Versus the, the first couple commandments, there shall be no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself any idols, and you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. He first sets himself up by saying the first three commandments say God is is different than we are. Now, is that a good thing? Yes or no? It, it should be a good thing. Because what's, if God is the same as we are, what does that mean for our salvation? We're lost. We have nothing. And the truth is, is that we, we see the sinfulness of ourselves by the law. But God starts off by saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So, real quickly, what are some of the gods that we deal with in our lives? And, and, and we, could, we could go on for days on the things that we put before our God. For some of us, your work is your God. You have placed God in a place of, I will, I will get time for God whenever, whenever I'm not working. Some of you have put money ahead of God. Some of you have put your family. Some of you have put sports. We can put any number of things before God. You can put coffee before God. That's Josh. He's a sinner. He, he needs help. Uh, he, he's, he's not here to defend himself, so uh, I'll, I'll drink water out of my drink, out of my cup. God's holy beverage. Uh, he gave it to us. Uh, but, uh, I, sorry, I have, to, I have to at least poke fun. He poked fun at me, so it's only fair. But when we look at the fact that there's this quote I want to share with you. It says this, the law was never given as a means of salvation. 
Think about that. When God gave the law to the people of Israel, when he gave these Ten Commandments, he didn't give it to them so that they would be saved. That was not the purpose of giving them the law. The, the reason for giving them the law was to prove that they couldn't live up to it. Again, that was the purpose of it, but I think sometimes we as human beings have that tendency to go, you know what? If I'm good enough, if I live well enough, then I'm going to be okay. Who here thinks that you can be good enough to be saved? I hope no hands go up. <laughs> Thank you. How many people here think the world believes that if you're good enough, you can be saved? We, I mean, they think that if you, if you fill in the blanks, if, if, I, if I'm good to the people, if I'm good to this, then I'll be saved. I have news for us this morning, folks. There is salvation in Jesus Christ alone, not in good works. But the hard part is that a lost and dying world believes that they can get there if they're good enough. But the interesting thing is, is God said in his word said, number one, you can't be good enough. You never will be. But the funny thing is, is the Pharisees in Jesus' day, you know, uh, by the way, a good friend of mine, Ken Dillard, put it this way. He said, the Bible is clearest and most concise in the life and times of Jesus Christ. It's easiest to understand the Bible if we read the Gospels, because that's just where, but the further you go in either direction, the harder it is to understand. Who here has read the book of Revelation and scratched your head? All, all of us have been like, God, what was that about seven seals, seven cups, and flying locusts, and fun stuff like that? Or you go to Genesis and like, how did God create the world in seven days? I mean, does that make sense to anybody here? If it does, write a book and you'll make millions. Um, but what I would say is this, it's, it's, the further you are away, it gets hard to understand, but if you point it to Jesus, it makes sense. So why would God give us the law to tell us that we, that we can't live up to him? Like, that we can't live up to this, and the truth is, he gave us the law so that he could provide a way for us to be made right. That's the reason he gave it to us. He gave the people of Israel this law, and he said, you shall have no other gods before me, make no idols, um, of my likeness, and you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. And the truth is, is that all of those things were set up to say, God is different than me. And I am grateful for that. And I hope you are too this morning, because if God is not different than you, he's not worthy of your worship. If God is the same as you are, why are you here? <laughs> And I hate to say that, I love to see you, I love your faces, but if you believe that God is the same, and there are, there are religions who believe that God has that same, he's the same as I am, he's not above, he's not holy, what's the point of that? And there is no point. And so my encouragement for us this morning is, is that when we look at the Ten Commandments, when we look at the story of Israel, and, and, and I'd put it this way, the people of God had, had, had spent all this time walking out of Israel, and if we flip back a couple pages um, in your Bible, if you want to, if you, I always love reading the, the headers, and we, we read all these things that God had done. But yet, real quick to, to jump to the end of this passage, what happens when they hear God speak from the mountain? What is their response to God? Fear. <laughs> now, what has God done so far for them? I mean, nothing, right? He didn't provide 10 plagues to get the, or not 10 plagues, the plagues to get him out of Egypt. He didn't provide parting a Red Sea. He didn't provide water out of a rock. He didn't do any of this stuff, right? But yet the first thing they respond when they hear the voice of God is fear. Why is that? Because truth is, is that we all know, and here's my example. I always give this example. We have all been driving along on the interstate, maybe going a little faster than we should, a little over that, that, that five mile an hour over, you know, or whatever that we tell ourselves is legal, right? What happens the second you see a police officer sitting on the side of the road? You slam on the brake, and you start going slower than the speed limit, but why? Because we've all been guilty. We all know a time when we've probably been going 15 to 30 over the speed limit, and the police officer didn't catch us. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you I'm a sinner, and, and I hope you know that. Um, I was driving um, back from Cedarville. There's, uh, Sarah Shot was up at a camp at Cedarville, and there's a stretch of road between the two, and, it's, and it goes from like 45 to 35 to 25. And this car, I was going 45. I was, good, I was a good Christian. I wasn't sinning. Um, and this car goes flying past me in 45. And I know up ahead is 35 and 25. 
And I'm sitting there, how many of you have ever done this? Like, Lord, help them get where they're going, and may there be a police officer in the 25. <laughs> and you know what? There was a police officer in that 25. <laughs> I pull up, and that car is pulled over on the side of the road with a police officer behind it. I'm like, Lord, thank you for your justice. <laughs> But that's why I slow down when I see a police officer. Because you know what? I know I'm guilty. I've been in those moments when I've deserved the justice of God. He is different than I am. And so we put on the brakes knowing God, I, mm, I know these things. That's, that's why that fear, there's validity in that. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Proverbs tells us that. And it's that idea that God is supposed to invoke in us this sense of he is not the same as I am. I, I always give this example. Sometimes if you struggle with understanding that God is different, when we worship God, when we come here on Sunday morning, how many people here can say that you've prepared your heart for worship incorrectly and correctly at times? We all can. There are days that you come to church and you're like, I've, I've got it all together. Um, some of you who have kids are like, my child poked me in the eye this morning before I came, or whatever it is that's caused you to be distracted this morning. I don't, we don't know. But there are times that we enter the throne room of God to worship, and we are ill-prepared to be in the presence of God. Um, the example I give, a, a friend of mine, his name is Mike Harlan, he was the head of Lifeway Worship for a while, he said he got invited to the White House. He got invited to the White House. This was during the Bush administration, and he had, he had been there before, but this was the first time he got an official invite. He was going to get an a escort around the grounds, and it was going to be special. So he said he pulled up to the, the special gate that he had been told to pull up to. And the, the officer standing there said, all right, so you're Mr. Harlan. You're supposed to be here. Wait right here. So Mike said, I walked over to this little area that I was supposed to stand at. And he's like, I looked around. I had my wife and my kids with me. And he's like, I've been to this before. I'll just show them around a little bit. So he starts walking them around the grounds of the White House. That's not a good idea. <laughs> so he's like, this is the front lawn. This is this. And, and, sudden, and, and Mike said, suddenly I realized something. I looked up, and there are secret service all around looking at me like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he said, suddenly I had this realization that I was not prepared for where I was. <laughs> I had been invited somewhere very specifically to be escorted by someone who's supposed to be there. And I was not where I was supposed to be. He's like, then you look up at the top of the White House and there are snipers and all this stuff. And you're like, let's go back to where we're supposed to be. He's like, go back to our little waiting area and said that that person finally came. Luckily, nothing bad happened to them. But here's the thing, folks. When we come to worship our God and we walk into the throne room of grace without preparing ourselves for being in the presence of God, truth is, is that our God is righteous and just. And he wants us to worship him. And the nice thing is, is that, is our God a just God? Yes or no? Is our God a gracious God? Yes or no? I am so glad for both of those. Because <laughs> those days that we walk into our God and we prance around the throne room um, as if we own the place. And he looks at us and says, child, I love you, but we're going to have to work on some things. <laughs> We've got to work on how you enter into my place of worship. And God very graciously will work on us and give us grace in those moments. But that's that idea that God set up these Ten Commandments first and foremost to say, you guys have to get it straight, who I am. And let me say that this morning. If you do not know who God is first, what else follows is irrelevant. It does not matter. If you don't have God in his right place, you'll never have the rest right. So let's, let's keep reading. So, so the first three... He starts off with this idea that we have sinfulness that distances us from God. Hebrews 4, chapter, verses 14 through 17 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who does not sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all ways, things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with what? Does anybody know what that next word is? Let us draw near with confidence. All right, so I just told you, don't walk into the throne room of grace without preparing yourself. It says, walk into the throne room, draw near to God with confidence to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. 
again, this idea that you first have to realize that God is separate. He's holy. He's amazing. But the awesome thing is that he didn't leave it there. There's so many religions that leave it that God is this fearful thing. He said, what does he say? Draw near to the throne room as what? What's the word? All right, um, we're going to try this. Uh, Josh tries this on occasion. The word is confidence. So draw near to the throne of grace with? There you go. You did that confidently. Well done. Um, But here's the thing. How many of us can say that we draw near to our God with confidence? Do we? Because do we believe that when we talk to God that he hears us? Do we believe that when we worship him, when we sing songs of praise, that he hears the songs that we sing? Do we believe that when we read the word of God, that those words come off the page and penetrate our hearts, dividing us the the dividing bones, spirit, joint, and marrow, all this stuff. Do we believe that? I hope we do, but does that actually change who we are? The the phrase is, so what? Um, Does it matter? So God's different, but we should approach him with great confidence. Um, So the first first three Ten Commandments say God is different. The next three say, the next say that God has provided a way a mediator, if you will. So if you, if you look down in verse 8, so this is a fun one. So remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Who here is here today? All right, hold on, let's try that again. Who here is here today? Good job. Okay, that's better. 100%, you're here today. Now, here's my better question. Does that mean you are following that commandment? Just being present, does that mean that you are following a commandment? No, I hear a no. Like, I see lots of shaking heads of no. All of these commandments, just because, and Jesus later on says what? Said if, says do not murder, do not steal, but if you've thought ill of your brother, that commits. So we've all been guilty of coming to church on Sunday morning and finding ourselves unprepared to worship or unwilling to, to worship. Now, here's, here's the thing. I'm, I'm your creative arts pastor slash worship guy, so of course I've got to talk about worship. But what you have to understand is my definition of worship, and I, I say this often, worship is your response to who God is and what he has done. That does not require music. It does not require anything other than your honest response to God. So, what are some ways that you can respond to God? And here, I'll take some off the table. Singing his praise, that's one. What are some ways that you can respond to God? Go. Obedience Obedience by obeying, absolutely, that is one way. Prayer. What's that? Worship in general, what else? How can you respond to God? What's that? Be still, yeah. Go. Seek him, tithe, yep, offering. What else? Helping others. Dancing, good. Who here wants to get up here and dance? That's, that's all you got for me. That's more like a hop, but uh, I'm a good Baptist. You can only one, raise one leg at a time. You have to have one <laughs> foot planted on the ground. What else? What are some other ways that you can respond to God? Believe. The the truth is, is that, here's my question. I think sometimes we very much look at other people and we say, that person is a good worshiper of God because we see an external response, which is valid. There are external responses. Lifting of hands, bowing down, you know, physical Manifestations of worship are part of that. But it is not an equal response to God being still, truly listening for the voice of God. Of course it is. And I think sometimes it's, it's hard because I think, you know, we've, we've, we're in a world that very, is very external. But the thing is, this says, keep the, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Set something apart time that you can respond to God. Now, obviously, we do Sunday, Sundays to help facilitate that, but here's my question. 
does that say, remember the two and a half hours, I'll give you, if you're a good Christian, you came to Sunday school. Um, does that say that two and a half hours, remember two and a half hours, and the rest is yours to do whatever you want? Is that what it says? It says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, by the way, I'm not saying that, that means like everyone has to cancel all your plans. The deacons have a meeting after this. Um, they just have to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy by eating food together or something. Um, but the truth is, is that we very much compartmentalize Sunday and this couple hours, and we say, that's my remember the Sabbath, and I've kept it holy. I'm good. By the way, does that, have you ever heard of anybody else who did things like that? And they were called the Pharisees, who were really good about saying, you know what, I've got 300 and some extra laws that I can keep. What did I say at the very beginning? Is the law for salvation? No. The Pharisees believed that if they lived up to it, or they gave people enough laws, they could do it. It'll never save you. The law will never save you. And the truth is, is remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, is one of those examples where we as Christians sometimes very much like to say, well, this is what it means and what it doesn't mean. So does it say two and a half hours or does it say the Sabbath? It says the Sabbath. So how are you today going to keep the Sabbath holy? How are you today? And and I'll give you a a break. Maybe it's been a rough morning. How are you going to spend the rest of this day keeping your eyes on Jesus as opposed to the eyes on yourself. Um, Meditate on his word. Study it. What are some other ways? How do we do this? And the the amazing thing is, is that God does not require vain offerings. He He requests that you offer your worship. You can't offer mine. Like, all right, I'm a music person, and I get accused of occasion on singing everything. In terms of when someone says something, I'm like, well, that's a song. I'll, I'll, I'll just sing it for you. Um, my offering of worship is different than yours, and God does not want you to offer my offering, my sacrifice. He wants yours. So how will you uniquely offer your worship today? That's what God wants. That's the Sabbath. That's setting yourself apart and saying, God, here's my life, and I'll offer it to you. Again, this idea that God provided a way. Again, so he first said, I'm holy. The next several say, I'm di- like, here's how we can be right again. I can worship God rightly. I can, I can um, worship God rightly. I can honor my father and mother. These, these aspects are the next step of things. So he says, so God, you're different. You made a way. And he finishes off by saying, if I get those first two right, what's possible? I can be right with others. So those next ones all relate to each other. And so who here can say, again, I have some work to do when it deals with having to deal with other people. All of us have to deal with other people. And um, the church would be great if we didn't have to deal with people. Um, (laughs) But the truth is, is that God put us together for a reason. And that reason is to make himself known. Um, Flip over in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Um, I want us to look at something real quick in light of this. So Jesus, so it's not Jesus, God gave the Ten Commandments. And in the cloud and in the thunder on the mountain, he, 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 he shouts out his law to these people, and they were afraid. Um, we have another picture of this in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah has this vision of the Lord, right? We all know this passage pretty well. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, which would have been awesome to see. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, two two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So what was the seraphim's response to God? They said, holy, holy, holy. That was their response. So that was their worship they were driven to. So that was how they responded to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so... To start off with, we have a picture of Isaiah sees God for who he is, right? So that first section of Ten Commandments, he suddenly has a realization that God is different than he is. Even the angels cry out, 
holy, to, to use a different phrase, different, different, different. You know, set apart, set apart, set apart is the Lord God Almighty. And by the way, they can stand the presence of God. What can we not? We can't. We can't stand the presence of God. Again, that's why the people of Israel were afraid at that point. But he says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Verse 4, the foundations of the threshold trembled. The voice came out of it and said, and then said to me, and then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God of, the, the Lord of hosts. Here's the thing. He realized in that moment, I'm doomed. <laughs> I've entered into the presence of God, and I don't belong here. Why? Because I'm a sinner. When we have a right understanding of who God is and His commandments, we suddenly realize where we stand which is we are condemned and we deserve death. That's what he told us. That's what the gospel tells us is that we deserve death. But again, he sees God for who he is, and he says, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king. And he says, I live among a people of unclean lips. The thing is, is that when we have a right understanding of our relationship with God, what does that mean about my neighbor? Where do I stand in relationship to my neighbor? Am I any different than they are? I'm not. I'm equally worthy of the justice and judgment and, and wrath of God as my neighbor who lives next door. But do we treat it like that? Do we believe that we are the same as our neighbor? Or do we believe that we are better than because we have salvation in Jesus? And, and I don't want you to answer that question. Don't, don't raise your hand on that. Because truth is we've all done it. Um, who here is going through the book of Jonah right now uh, in, in our small groups? We have a lot of people going through the book of Jonah. So what did Jonah believe about himself compared to the people of Nineveh? He, he thought he could get away from them, but what did he believe about him compared to them? He was better than them. I don't want to deliver this stupid message to the people of Nineveh. They don't deserve it. I'm a, I'm, I belong to God's people. I, we deserve this. Why did they deserve God to be just? And, and the funny thing was, we were talking on Wednesday night, uh, this past Wednesday in our small group, and said, I really should just come up here and give the same message that Jonah gave to the people. We're not there yet for most of you. Uh, he gave the shortest sermon ever and saw one of the biggest groups of people come to, come to faith in God. He said, basically, 40 days and you're all going to be dead. And they said, Lord, forgive us, and they repented. So there we go. All right. Let's all bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's, let's have an invitation. Um, but the thing is, is that throughout the Bible, we see pictures of people that we put on pedestals who constantly say the same things we say, which is, I'm, I felt I was better than this person. Jonah did it. Isaiah does it. And everybody else does too, because we are built to look at each other. And what does God tell us to do? Who should we be looking at? Him. That's all we should look at. But we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're still going to fail. But here's the thing. So if we have a right picture of who God is, it's going to change the way that we look at each other. Because I will always be on the same level as the person that's next to me. Um, a long time ago, and I meant to get a picture but couldn't find it because my phone died. Um, but there's a picture we took um, there was a group that came on campus, and they come on campus on a regular basis, and they bring these very large signs, and they say lots of very bad things about the people on campus in the name of Christ. They come on campus telling them that they are, they are fornicators. Um, I can't remember all the words that they use, and I, nor would I share most of them because I don't believe most of them. But they, I remember this big sign that they brought on campus, and it said, You need Jesus. What's the problem with that statement? You. Who needs Jesus? We. It's, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not you have fallen short. You have sinned and fall. All have sinned. And I remember pulling one of these guys aside and asking him, said, so you're telling me. And I asked him, said, so do you believe that since you've come to Christ you haven't sinned? And he's like, yep. I'm like, Wow! 
I was like, well, let's, let's talk through the Bible a little bit. And, and he, would, he would not be swayed from his mindset. And I'm sitting there going, so you truly believe that you are better than the people that need this gospel? And I remember sitting there amongst teachers who were watching, because actually what happened was probably about 300 students had gathered and were shouting these people down. And I was standing there with a bunch of professors, and they were like, they don't understand. These students don't understand that their shouts aren't going to change their mind, and they're going to be the ones who get in trouble. And it's, that's exactly what happened. And a couple students went and took their sign, and those students got, by campus, by campus security, unfortunately, that campus security walked up and goes, you've got to come with me now. You've infringed upon their rights of free speech, and, and those students don't understand. But here's the thing, that picture is what we take to the world, that you need Jesus as opposed to we need Jesus. Folks, this morning, we need Jesus because without him, we stand condemned by the law. Those Ten Commandments, every one of them we've broken. You've disobeyed your parents, right? Any kids in here? Surely you're, you're perfect. I see some, we're all kids, I guess. Uh, so we've all disobeyed our parents. We've all lied. We've all done these things. We need Jesus this morning. Last little thought is this. So Isaiah said, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord seated on his throne. I realized that woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips and I've seen the king. The next response was God said, God calls out from that moment and says, he heard a voice saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God cries out and says, in the midst of Isaiah saying, I'm unworthy of being here. I don't deserve to be here. God cries out and says what? I know. (laughs) I created you, but yet I'm still going to extend the invitation. I have people who need to hear who I am. Who will go for me? And what's Isaiah's response? Lord, here I am, send me. Back to the, back to the Exodus passage. The interesting thing is, is that they shout the thunder that cries out from the mountains, this, this image that we have of God being holy. But yet he invites them in and says, I'll make a way. And obviously we know that Jesus is how he made the way. And this morning, what I, would, what I would ask us to do, service is a little different this morning. We, we, we had the message at the beginning, but what I'm going to ask us to do this morning is I want us to truly consider what it means that God is different than we are. Every person in this room needs to understand that you need to, un- you need to see God as different than yourself first. Next, you need to see that God made a way. Because you know what? Even though God is completely different than we are, what did he do? He sent his son in flesh so that we could sympathize. He could sympathize with us so that he would know what it was to suffer. So not only did he say, know me as being this God who's different, but he also said, know me as being the God that is here. God came, so he he created the world perfect. He then, sin came in, and we're now separated from God. But the great thing is, is he sent Jesus. He lived a perfect life. Jamie did a great job of sharing this a minute ago in the baptismal waters. Do you believe that not only did he send his son, but his son died on a cross for our sins to pay the payment that we couldn't pay, but then rose again on the third day, to conquer sin and death. And that, uh, anybody who's seen the Passion of the Christ, um, that picture that has of like Satan cheering at the death of Jesus, and I believe that's what happened. He was like, I did it. I won. Three days later, those cheers turned into utter defeat because Jesus rose from that grave. I mean, what good news. Because if he didn't raise, then we can't be raised. But everyone who is here, who starts to understand that God is different than we are. Start there. But then says, you know what? Jesus came. And what happens is is that if we get that right, 
and we understand that Jesus made a way, I can then be right with you. You can be right with me. And, and the running statement that I say is, look around you, real quick, look around you at the people who are around you. This is an interesting group of people who've gathered in this place this morning, right? All age ranges. I mean, if you weren't family, we wouldn't be in this room together. Just guess it. Uh, it's just that why, why would God put us together like this? It's to show that it's possible. That if we as the people of God can say God is holy, but he made a way through Jesus for me to be right with these people, to be my family. By the way, I love you people. I do. Um, some of you more than others, um, but I love you all. But the grace that God showed through his son Jesus is salvation that's available. So the law cannot save you, but you know what can? Jesus can. And that's the, that's the invitation that I want to share with you this morning. Is I hope you have a relationship with Jesus. And I don't want to assume anything. I know most of the faces in this room. But that does not mean that even those faces that I know have really, truly understood what it means to have a relationship with him. So I would like you to think for a moment. Just close your eyes. And the reason we close our eyes is just to focus. There's nothing magical about it. But here's the question this morning. Do you know who God is? Do you know that he is different than you are? Those first commandments, no other God before me. He's a jealous God. Do you know that God is worthy of our praise? Secondly, do you know that God provided a way? That he provided a way for us to be connected with him again? And lastly, if you know that, then it affects the way that we deal with each other. So this morning, I, I would ask that you think for a moment. Do I fit into one of those categories? Maybe I'm struggling with relationships with others. And you need to spend some time this morning righting that wrong in your life. God, I don't, and say, God, I don't understand how to be right with others. Well, the truth is, is those other things affect it. So here's what I'm going to ask of us this morning. We're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to have a time where we're going we're gonna to allow, um, allow for people to respond to who he is. And again, here's the thing. What God wants from you this morning is your response. How would you respond to God today? And we're going to do invitation a little bit different this, this morning, too. There's going to be, there'll be words on the screen. There's going to be a song playing. Feel free to sing along. But here's what I would request of you. Would you be willing? Would you be willing this morning to earnestly lay down the things that we hold to and say, and I'm especially going to hone in on this one, that it says, keep the Sabbath day, honor that day, keep it holy. Would you sacrifice this day to the Lord and say, God, no matter what my plans are, I will keep those plans. But Lord, everything I do today will be done in the name of the Lord. Would you say that, God, I'm going to be an honest person, a person of character. I'm obviously not going to defame my brother. I'm not going to covet the things of my neighbor. All these things. Would you, would you in your heart right now, would you truly seek to do that? So what we're going to do is we're going to take an opportunity. And, and, and as usual, I'll, I'll be up here for a couple moments. If you need somebody to pray with, we'll have people who will be up here to pray. If you need to come forward and you need to say, and you need to just spend time in prayer, if you want to do that, the, these altars are open. But more importantly this morning, however you need to respond to your God, you do it. Because you know what? If God is worthy of our worship, of our response, and if God provided a way for us to be saved, then honestly, we all need to know that we need Jesus this morning. 
and we all need to know. And sometimes it takes someone coming and praying up here for someone to see someone and go, you know what? If that person apparently needs prayer for something, I need prayer for something. I need to pray. And truthfully, we all, we need Jesus this morning. We need the Ten Commandments, the law that God provided. And folks, this morning, we need to respond to him. So let me pray for us. And I'm just going to ask that you respond however you need to. I'll, I'll have a stand when I say amen. But I'd encourage you to respond how you need to this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning, the Word of God speaks to our lives and gives us faith, gives us hope. But Lord, it also gives us an understanding that judgment is real. Lord, that we are different than you. So Lord, this morning, as we as the church gather and worship, gather to respond together, God, I pray that the word of God would do its work in our lives. Lord, that we would understand that, yes, there are these commandments that we, we don't live up to, but even your son said, the ones that, when asked what the greatest was, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second like these, love your neighbor as yourself. I thank you for providing a way for us to live up to that commandment. So Lord, this morning we offer this time to you and say thank you. Lord, we offer this time to you and say, God, please speak to us. Lord, give us a response that is worthy of our God. So, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. If you want to pray, stay seated. If you want to worship, sing with it. The song simply says, Lord, I need you. And this is all of our cries today. So let's, let's worship together but in this response time. Lord, I come. I come. Bowing here, I find my rest Without you, I fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I
have a seat this morning. How great our God is this morning. Um, as our ushers come forward, this is a, you know, offering is a, Larry actually shared a minute ago, you know, our response to God includes our offering that we give to him, the tithes that we bring. But the truth is, is that God doesn't want your empty offerings either. You know, if you bring it out of duty or habit, you know what? God wants a, an honest offering of praise to him this morning. So here's my request for us this morning as we move into a time of offering. I'm going to pray for the offering. But we're going to see a video that talks about the idea of that offering being something that God will take and he will multiply. So you believe that God will take the gifts that you bring and multiply them for his glory. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sing that the breath in our lungs will pour out the praises of our God. But Lord, do we truly believe that the words that we share with a lost and dying world, the light that is shining through us, would truly impact it through the lostness and seeing people come to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would truly break our hearts for the lostness of our world. Lord, that we would not just sing that all the earth will shout your praise. But Lord, that we would have a time when we would be able to see that happen because we see the people of God standing up and being willing to share the truth that we have in our hearts. Lord, be with us this morning, even in this time of response of worship, in this offering time, where we offer it all back to you and say thank you for taking it, multiplying it, and showing who you are through it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The world can be a dark, lonely place. Everywhere you go, people are hurting, lost, and in need. But I believe there's still hope, there's still healing, and there's still light. To God, He multiplies it. I may not have a lot to give, but I've shared food, medicine, water, clothes, in God's love with millions. Because I know I'm not alone. lives for Christ, whether that's through water. And the, I love that imagery because it says, bring you the tithes into the storehouse. And what does it say God will do? He will open up the gates, flood it out. And I love that he drops the, the piggy bank and those doors open. And so much is true of what God will do with the gifts that we give to him. So this morning, let's all stand together. We're going to close this morning by singing, asking the King of Heaven would come down and join us as we take this Sabbath day.